Yeah, that's a great question. So for the past 54 years or so at this point, we've kept stats on like the emotional well-being of our youth and young adult population here in the United States. Yeah. And so metrics that we would use would be uh, depression, anxiety, loneliness, self-injurious behavior, suicidal ideation. So that's where I'm thinking about killing myself, suicide attempt. I've attempted to kill myself, successful suicide, as well as visits to the emergency room for psychiatric purposes. So we kept mm-hmm. track of this for yeah, roughly half a century at this point. All of those stats were decreasing until 2008. And then since mm-hmm. 2008, it's gone up every single year and has not stopped going up. So it's increasing faster and faster and faster. So when I speak on this topic to parents or professionals, one of the questions I ask them is what happened in 2008? And a lot of the most common guess is um, the housing recession. And it's a good guess, but that's not it. It was mass popularity of the first iPhone. Mm. So all of a sudden you had a supercomputer Mm -hmm. with you that you could access anything anywhere at any time for the most part. So average American keeps their phone on them, like it's in my hand or in my pocket or within three feet of me, one arm length, 97% of the 24 hours in a day. Wow. And so, okay, well, are you telling me that the iPhone is responsible for this? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's played a role in that now you had unfettered access to social media. Mm -hmm. And so based on the research and then my clinical practice and let's say roughly the 5,000 professionals that I've spoken with on this topic at this point, uh, the way that I see it is the cell phone has proven to be a bridge to unfettered access. Mm-hmm. And with that, when you have unfettered, unrestricted, unregulated access to social media, the more time that you spend on there, um, the greater likelihood that we have for like FOMO, fear of missing out, or comparing yourself to what you see in others. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the biggest challenges that I see in the clinical work that I do is, hey, I think this about myself. I feel this about myself, but I see what I see in other people. But where we struggle is to take that step back and say, well, what I'm seeing in other people might not be a reflection of reality. It might be a Mm -hmm. projection on their own. Um, And then with social media, we have um, comparisons. So as species, we're just inherently wired to compare ourselves, even if we're not aware of the fact that we're actually engaging in comparison. Mm. So when we look at, say, women who go onto social media, well, 90% of the time that they go on there, they compare themselves, whether they're conscious of it or subconsciously, to the pictures that they're seeing of other women. Hmm. And of that 90% of the time, 90% of the time that they do that, they engage in what we would call upward comparison. Mm -hmm. So to make it readily understandable, that's like me comparing myself to a male model. So that means roughly 81% of the time that the woman goes on there, she's going to walk away feeling worse about herself because she's engaged in upward comparison with someone that is better than her at X, Y, Z, fill it in. Mm. Now for men, same thing. We engage in comparison um, roughly 90% of the time that we go on there. And just the upward comparison is a little bit less. It's about 70% of the time, which means still for men, three out of five times that they go on there, they walk away feeling worse about themselves or inadequate. And it's that fear of inadequacy, the fear of rejection that confirms the inadequacy that leaves people in this predisposed state of not wanting to be found out, thereby I'm anxious all the time that you're going to see me and reject me. So I can't show you the real me because if you knew the real me, the way that I see myself, you would reject me and I'm not good enough. 